2 Corinthians chapter number 11 and verse number 1. The church at Corinth had a lot of problems, folks. A lot of problems. And the apostle addresses one of them here in the second, uh, in the fourth verse of 2 Corinthians chapter 11. We start reading with verse 1. Scripture says, Would to God ye would bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, you might well bear with him. And his credentials... For I suppose I was not a whit behind the very chiefest apostles. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray now you'd bless your holy word. Amen. You can be seated. They questioned his apostleship, therefore his authority. There were those at the church at Corinth who were trying to teach uh, pagan doctrine, attacking and assaulting the deity of Christ, and in the process of it, preaching another Jesus. A Sunday school class this morning, past two Sundays, we have dealt at length with the perversion and distortion of the true Christ as the Gnostics present him today and as uh, other pagan religions have assaulted him and his identity. As I say to you this morning, I'm going to say it again, it's very, very important, very important. You can get a lot of things in the Bible wrong and still go to heaven. You can, believe me, you can. You can get a lot of things wrong in the Bible and go to heaven, but you'll never get Christ wrong and go to heaven. You better get him right. You better get him right. And the Lord Jesus Christ, therefore, as I've told the Sunday school class time and again, the doctrine of Christology has to do with the identity of Christ. The doctrine of Christology or the doctrine of Christ is the very most important thing in that Bible bar none. It is all important. It is all important. And so here in 1 Corinthians 11, the Bible says that they were teaching, 2 Corinthians 11, that somebody was preaching another Jesus, and by doing that, another spirit, and then by doing that, another gospel. The apostle told the church at Galatia, he said, if I or an angel from heaven come unto you preaching any other gospel, let him be anathema, let him be cursed. In other words, let him come under divine judgment when he tries to preach any other gospel than the grace of God. Anything apart from that deviates from that, my friend, is straight from hell. No doubt about it, because it will lead you to hell if it's not the simple, straight gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. This morning, let's talk about some of these other Jesus. Some of the other Jesuses. There's the Jesus that's the philosopher, the sophist Jesus. If you go to Constantinople or Istanbul, what it's called today, you'll find the church of Hagia Sophia. Hagia Sophia literally means the church of the holy wisdom. Hagia Sophia. Hagia is holy. Sophia is the feminine of wisdom. There are those 2,000 years ago that called the Lord Jesus Christ a sophist. That simply means one who's out preaching wisdom. But the Apostle Paul says, not the wisdom of this world, which is foolishness to God, but the wisdom of God. And the wisdom of God is how he chose to save us and manifest himself to us. The Lord Jesus Christ is the very wisdom of God, manifest in flesh. But the Lord Jesus Christ is not someone down here preaching wise philosophy. Far, far more than that. Then he's preached as the revolutionary, uh, you know, liberation theology and all that you hear today, that they reduce the Lord Jesus Christ to nothing more than a message that has to do with social reform. My friend, the Lord Jesus Christ is far above social reform. He didn't come to the world to reform it. He came to the world to seek and save that which is lost. Then there are those as the New Age Movement and others that teach that he's the ascended master. 
that somehow or another the Lord Jesus Christ had tapped into some enlightenment from above that the rest of us need to tap into. It's not about enlightenment, folks. That's not what you need. You need salvation. You must be born again. Then there's the cultural example or the cultural Jesus. Who is he? He's the one where you sprinkle little babies and you christen them. When they come into the world, they're baptized, become Christians. From that moment on through the rest of their life, they live like a dog and yet they think that when they die, they're going to go to heaven because mom and dad were Christians and I was christened in this Christian church and so forth and so on. That's cultural Christianity, folks. Cultural Christianity won't do you one bit of good. Christianity is about Christ. It's about him personally. And then there, my friend, are others. There's the prophet of Islam. The prophet of Islam is not the Christ of the Bible. Oh, the Islam, they'll tell you about Jesus. Oh, yes, he was a great prophet, so forth and so on. But as far as him being the son of God, no, 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 no. God has no son. Allah is just one. And God has no son. I'm sorry. The Lord Jesus Christ is the son of the living God. Amen. Amen. And then there's the Christ of liberal theology, who is really not much more than we are, to tell you the truth about it. For liberal theology reduces him to mankind and makes him just a, one of us. And that's all he is, is just a good man to show us how to live and follow in his steps and live by his teachings and the golden rule. And everything will be okay one day when we die and go out to meet God. No, I'm sorry, folks. The Lord Jesus Christ is the Lord God Almighty. The real Jesus according to 2 Timothy chapter number 1 and verse number 9 the apostle says this about him in 2 Timothy 1 9 here is the real Jesus the Bible said who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling not according to our works but according to his own purpose and grace which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. It is that title of Savior that, my friend, that is so great as it relates to the Lord Jesus. Because he bought that and paid for it. Nobody handed it to him. He paid for it at the cross and shed his blood and gave himself for us and our sins. Therefore, the Lord Jesus Christ of the Bible is the Savior. If you've never needed a Savior, you don't know him. If you were baptized as a baby, that's got nothing to do with your relationship with the Lord. Somebody confirmed you in church. Somebody sat down with you and read off a list. And you say, I believe all of this. But when were you saved? You must be born again. He's the Savior of all men, especially them that believe. Paul said in 1 Timothy, Savior is what he paid for. He purchased it. You can't buy it. You can't earn it. You can't live a good enough life to go to heaven when you come to the end of your way. He must save you. And so therefore the real Jesus is the Savior. Have you ever been saved? Have you been saved? Do you know a time and a place where you can say, I know that I changed and passed from death into life? Say, preacher, I've always believed. Your head won't get you to heaven. How do you know the difference between intellectual belief and salvation in the Bible? Some of you say, I believe all the things the Bible says about Christ. Yes, but do you know that your life changed at a point in this world sometime in the past you were saved? You must be born again. So the Bible says that he's the Savior. The real Jesus is not about starting a religion. He's not a martyr. He's not a teacher. He's not an example. We don't follow his teachings in his life. And that makes us Christians know we come to him as lost sinners. And he saves us and forgives us and cleanses us. And then the real Jesus is the God-man. In 1 Timothy chapter number 3 and verse number 16, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. There's so many people today in their zeal to try to build some kind of a church. Build this huge congregation. I don't know what the reason is. If they don't love souls, what's the point? Unless it is just to promote themselves. 
But the bottom line is that the Lord Jesus Christ is presented to people as just a kind of a glorified one of them. He's just a good guy, a good buddy, wants to have fun with him. And everything just hunky-dory, let's just have a good time. And we're just going to go right on into heaven playing and, and playing games and having a good time. Folks, that's not the Jesus of the Bible. The Jesus of the Bible, the Son of God, is the God-man. Walking among men, no other man like this man, never man spake like this man. Who is this that walks on the sea? Who is this that speaks the word and the dead come forth? Who is such a man as this? My friend, there's only one like him. It's God manifest in flesh. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I and the Father are one. My John, over and over again, John reinforces the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's God. I wasn't saved by just a man. I was saved by the God man. You say that's important, preacher. It is all important. There is no other man that ever walked this earth that could make, lay claim to that title. As Abraham, as great as he was, was not God in flesh. Moses and David and, and, and Ezekiel and Daniel and Hosea. No, my friend, they're not God in the flesh. But the Lord Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. That means that he's able to save to the uttermost all that come to God by him. That means he can communicate to you on a level that no other one can communicate to you on. When you are tempted to sin, he knows what that temptation is about and he knows the escape that you need. He knows the grace that you need to be born again because he knows what's written in your heart. He knows how you feel in this world and he came and felt what you feel so that he could become a high priest at the right hand of the Father and he could succor those who need one. And we all need one. He's the God man. The book of Acts chapter number 20 and verse number 28 makes a startling statement about him. Acts chapter number 20 and verse 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. Amen. The blood of God bought the church and bought you. But where was the blood of God shed, folks? The blood of God was shed on the cross at Calvary. The blood of God was shed at the cross. And it was shed so you could be saved. So the real Jesus is the Savior. The real Jesus is the God-man. And the real Jesus is Lord of all. It acts in Revelation 19 and verse number 16, the last book in the Bible. The scripture says, And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Lord of lords and King of kings, God of gods, above and beyond all there is. When the Lord Jesus Christ comes back to this earth, those that know him will be caught up to meet him in the clouds. And then he begins to reveal himself to those who don't know him. The book of Revelation is all about the revelation of Jesus Christ when he comes back on a white horse as a man of war. The world wants war, they're going to get war. If the world wants death, they're going to have death. If the world loves shedding of blood, it's going to flow as high as a horse's bridle. If the world loves wickedness, God's going to open the gates of hell. And he's going to let the wicked come right up on the face of the earth. This world doesn't know what it wants, but it's going to get it. Because to reject the Lord Jesus Christ is to reject light and call darkness down on your soul. The book of Revelation reveals him as the Lord of Lords. King of Kings means that the king kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ and he will reign forever and ever. In Davos, Switzerland right now in the last few days have been meeting to try to hammer out some kind of an agreement over Syria. And the other day two foes came together and it wasn't about them but they came face to face. And that was the representative from China and the representative from Japan. And man did they have words for each other in public before the rest of them accusing each other of killing millions going back to World War II and even before. They are at each other's throat right now. China has shut off the Sea of China and my friend they are and what they do is precipitating war. Wars and rumors of wars. They've been fighting a war in the Middle East. 
for years. And now if China and Japan enters in, it may be just like Sarajevo in 1914, 16, 18, whatever it was, that World War I all of a sudden exploded upon the scene. Nobody expected a war to start like that. And the nations of the earth are brought into it. We are on the very verge at any moment. I live on a powder keg. Just imagine eating and drinking and sleeping and living on top of a powder keg that any moment could explode right underneath you. That's the world that we live in today. And the kingdoms of this world shall become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. He's coming back because he owns the world. He bought and paid for it at Calvary. He made it, then he paid for it. Amen. That's what a, quite a remarkable thing. When you begin to understand the character of God, begin to look into his heart, begin to understand who he is, you realize that he extends a hand to you. He'll let you make your own choices and then begin to pay and suffer for your choices. And then he'll reach down to where you are and say, now let me pull you out of it. And now maybe you'll listen to me this time. He's a good God. He's a gracious God. Well, preacher, the United Nations will finally bring the world together and they'll have peace. Oh, will they really? They'll beat their swords into plowshares and the day will come when men shall know war no more, but they'll have peace, not till the Prince of Peace comes on that white horse. And when the Prince of Peace comes on a horse, he comes with a sword. When he comes on a horse and comes with a sword, he comes to subject this earth. He doesn't ask of anything. The armies of heaven follow him on horses, white and clean, white robes, and out of glory they come down to this world. There are those right now in the country, most of, about over 50%, of, about 70% of the people in the country right now in America believe something is about to happen. You know why they believe that? Because the government of this country right now has gone screaming mad. They've gone mad. The man in the White House said the other day, he said, I've got a pen. I don't need Congress. I'll write my own law. So far, he's been able to do that and get away with it. So far, he's been able to get away with it. But there is an undercurrent in this country. There are many dissatisfied people. There are people who have been out of work for years. The whole world is at a boiling point, ready to explode. And you may be doing fine in your home. That's good. I'm glad you are. But a lot of people aren't. They're having a hard time paying their bills. And so the Lord lets the, uh, lets the, wicked, the abomination of the, or the wickedness of the Amorites come to a full. And when the day comes that he comes from the heavens, it won't be too late. It'll be just in time to rescue this earth. For except those days should be shortened, no flesh should be left alive. You say, preacher, man's going to solve his problems and he's going to make things better, is he? Walk out into the foyer and ask those 56 million babies that have been butchered in this country if it's better for them. 56 million babies. The safest place a baby ought to be is in its mother's womb. And in the United States of America, that's the most dangerous place in its mother's womb. Well, I had to further my career. I had, I didn't have, we didn't, it wasn't right time for a baby. All kinds of lame excuses to murder 56 million babies. Folks, that's a mind boggling figure. The Jews rightfully so constantly remind you that 6 million of them died in Europe in World War II at the hands of the Nazis and the ovens at Treblinka and Buchenwald and Belsen Belsen and Auschwitz. They died in those concentration camps and rightly so. But folks, 6 million pales in insignificance to the Holocaust that's been going on in this country since Roe versus Wade. I need to remind you, hunky-dory, prosperity, everything's just fine. It's all good. No, it's not. Innocent blood cries from the ground and somebody's going to give an account. That's why the King of Kings and Lord of Lords coming back. And when he comes back to this earth, the Bible says the kingdoms of the world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ. He'll take them. Man will never offer it up freely. Never. So when he comes back, he grabs it and said, now it's mine and sits down in Jerusalem with a rod of iron and he subjugates mankind to himself 
And that day will come as surely as you hear me. It may not come in my lifetime. It may not come in a hundred years. But to him that for a thousand day, years is a day and a day a thousand years, it doesn't make any difference. He's coming again. The Lord of all. He owns it all. In Romans chapter number four, verses seven through eight, though I love this part about him because this goes right along with him being the Savior. The real Jesus does this. Romans chapter number four, verse seven. Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Cometh this blessedness only on the, up, upon the, com, the circumcision only, or upon the circumcision, uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How was it then reckoned? When he was in circumcision or uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. God justified the ungodly before the law was ever given. And circumcision was given long before the law was given to prove that the law could not cleanse anybody. It was when Abraham looked up into the heavens and said, I believe, don't understand it, but if my seed's going to be as the stars of heaven, I believe it. And you know what happened there? The Bible said God imputed his righteousness to Abraham. Blessed is the man whose sins are forgiven. Every religion on the face of this earth, every religion, I don't care who it is, is constantly trying to figure out how to get peace. Well, I get peace through meditation. I'll get peace through offering, through self-sacrifice. I'll get peace through this. I'll get peace through that. All of the religions, I don't care if it's Buddhism, Hinduism, Gnosticism, or any religion, they're constantly seeking, searching, trying to satisfy the human soul. But I had a list as long as you could imagine. And in 1973, he forgave me for all of it. Blessed is the man whose sins are forgiven. I was told when I first got saved that that word blessed means happy. I didn't know anything back then. So I let it become part of my thinking and my vocabulary in my mind. Happy is the man. But you go home and you look up the word, it's Mercurios. And that word means that he's been brought into the favor of God. Far more than happy, he's been brought into the favor of God. Yes, to be forgiven of your sins, to have that burden lifted, to know that you're free, to know that you belong to God. You can't get that in religion. Favor from God. I've been blessed as Abraham was blessed. The Bible tells me in the book of Galatians chapter number three, in reference to that same thing in verse number eight, and the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel to Abraham saying, in these shall all nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. You hear that? I've been brought into favor. I've been blessed with Abraham. It started with faith at end in faith. There was a temporary period of time there where God tried them by the law. What happened, preacher? They failed. <clears throat> he tried them by human government. What happened, preacher? They built a tower to Babel. They failed. He tried them in direct revelation. He tried them walking with Adam. What happened, preacher? They called themselves after God himself. Fell with the angels. Every time God tried them, they failed. So what happened, preacher? He gave them grace and mercy and said, now try me. He made a covenant with himself and swore by his own name because he could swear by none greater. And he established a blood covenant that brings man into a relationship with God. Not by what I've done, not by what I can do. I stand this morning on the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. There is a blood atonement that has been offered for me that binds my soul, that secures my heaven, for I know that I've been born again by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. There is nothing greater than that. There is nothing greater than to know that your sins are forgiven. There is nothing that God can do for a man than to say, forgiven, forgotten, and gone. As far as the east is from the west. Oh, my preacher. You say, what about all that old stuff I did and nobody even knows about? It? Nobody needs to know about it. God knew it and God forgave it. And when he forgives it, he forgets it. That, my friend, is a man that's been brought into the favor of God. Favor of God. What's that mean, preacher? That means that God has a special relationship for you 
that he doesn't have for them. If you know the Lord, you walk in a place with God that they know nothing about. Who are they, preacher? The unsaved. The unsaved. Happy, from the old English word hap, you'll find it in the book of Ruth. It was her hap to fall upon the field owned by Boaz. What's that mean? It was a fortuitous thing. That's what hap has to do with. It has to do with, with fortuitous events. It has, has to do with things that, that just kind of come into your life and they happen. And so if they happen well, you're happy. But if they don't happen well, your hap is not too good. Well, folks, it's not about hap. <laughs> it's about blessed. It's about a positive affirmation from God that this is the way it's going to be. And you can't change it, Satan. I have blessed him. In the Old Testament, when they tried to bring a curse down upon God's people, when Balak tried to get Balaam to curse him, Balaam went up on top of a mount. He looked at the thousands, hundreds of thousands of Israel. He looked at them as sheep as they marched through the wilderness. And Balak said, now go curse them. They're my enemy. So Balaam went up there and he looked at them. And the Holy Ghost moved upon his soul. And he saw that light and he saw that glory and he saw that power of God with those people. And he went back to Balak and he said, I can't curse whom God has blessed. God's blessed them. I can't curse them. So God has blessed me. You can't curse me. Well, I want to. Well, go ahead. It won't do you any good. And when you start spitting at your vitriol and you're trying to curse me, it'll come right back on your head. Amen. 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 I warn you about that. Why don't you pray for me? And why don't you pray for each other? Why don't you bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ? Why don't you do that? Why don't you get a hold of the truth of Christianity? That we're here in this world and we need each other. And we need the power of God in our lives. Why don't you pray with one another and can commune with one another and commune with God and so fulfill the law of Christ, the love of Christ. I've been blessed. I've been blessed. I've been blessed. So how you doing, preacher? I'm blessed. So he laid you flat to your back. I'm still blessed. Said so your wife fell off the steps and broke her hip. I'm still blessed. Well, I've had this happen. I'm still blessed. No weapon. Formed against you shall prosper. Amen. Turn to Isaiah 43 and verse 1. I like this one. This is Isaiah the prophet. It's strong on the way he says this. Isaiah 43 verse 1. But now, thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. Now, oh, is Jacob and Israel the same person? Yes, they are. But it has to do with the way you're looking at them and what God may be trying to say to them. I've redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. And when thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. I gave Egypt for thy ransom, Ethiopian Seba, for thee. Did you hear that? Well, you say, preacher, Egypt is a sovereign nation. Yeah, but God's a sovereign God. <laughs> what did he say? He said, I chose you from Egypt. Ethiopia and Seba for myself. And Ethiopia and Seba and Egypt and the rest of them can live in peace as long as they acknowledge who owns you. There is a little speck of land over there on the eastern coast of the Mediterranean Sea right now with the Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu who has been treated like a dog by our government. And our government hasn't awakened yet. They haven't learned anything yet. We are, babe, we are a baby in diapers compared to Israel, the ancient people. This whole Bible is about Israel and the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and the Savior they gave us. 
And they'll learn the hard way. He that blesseth thee is blessed. And he that curseth thee is cursed. No weapon formed against thee shall prosper. I've been blessed. I'm going to close with these five things. These are the blessings of Abraham. God made a covenant with Abraham. He made a covenant with him. Do you know how he made it? Abraham was asleep. So what kind of a covenant is that? That's an unconditional covenant. I was asleep when God made that covenant 2,000 years ago. I didn't even exist. But he made it. He made it before I ever showed up. The blessings of Abraham is a promise of supply. God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. A lot of people have lost a lot of stuff during this recession. They call it the Great Recession because it is second only to the Great Depression, 1929. Only to that. And some say in some ways it's worse in some ways than the Great Depression was. It certainly has affected more people because there are more people in this nation now than had in 1929. A lot of people have lost their homes. There's an awful lot of people out there right now that owe more for a new house than that house is worth. They bought it in 2008, 9 during the bubble. They paid $300,000 for the house. The house has been devalued. The house is worth $200,000 now, but they got a $300,000 mortgage. You're $100,000 in red. That's just one illustration. Because of Obamacare, some folks are going to lose their job. Because if you have over so many employees, I forget, what is it, 29? If you have over 29 employees, then they're considered full-time. You have to carry them. Obama gave businesses a year before they have to implement that. But that becomes the law in a year. It didn't have anything to do with the election, did it, in 2014? Or the one preceding that. You see what I'm telling you, folks? There's a train wreck coming. And the train wreck is still coming. And you have in no way felt the full brunt of it. It is a coming, and when it hits, it's going to hit hard. God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Put your trust in the Lord. If your job evaporates because of Obamacare, God will give you another job. There are people out there walking the streets, they're going from church to church. They got no money. Who feeds you? God does. Who puts food on your table? God does. And that's what it's going to take. In this economy, folks, it is uncertain now. Make no mistake about it. We're not through anything. Obamacare is something where we have a shifting and a transfer of wealth. And I'm going to tell you who's paying for it. It's the middle class. That who, that who's, that's who's going to pay for it. Listen, if a man's got a hundred, if a man's got a thousand million dollars, he's a billionaire. Do you think he's going to miss a million? Do you think raising taxes or anything that he applies to it is going to have an effect on the super wealthy rich? While well, they laugh in your face, it's you it's going to hit. It's you, the middleman. The middle, the, um, the, uh, the one who goes out and works every day and works hard. God will supply. Then there's a promise of companionship. He said, I will never, ever, 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 never, never, never. Never, never, never leave you. That's what he means. He emphasizes it. It's emphatic in the Greek text. I will never, 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 ever, 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 ever leave you. We've been made for the glory of God. God's going to get glory. God's going to be glorified. His honor, his glory, his justice, his righteousness, his beauty, his holiness is going to be manifested in your life, whether you like it or not. <laughs> you can cooperate and be blessed. Or you can do this. Turn to Psalm 91 verse 11. In Psalm 91 verse 11. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Isn't that a wonderful scripture? Isn't that wonderful? He's going to protect you and take care of you. Isn't that wonderful? Now let me show you how the Bible works. Do you know who quoted that? 
the devil, Satan. What did he do, preacher? He quoted the scripture. Do you know what he did? He quoted the truth. But do you know what he did? He misapplied it. He gave it blanket application. Do as you please. He's going to protect you. Everything's going to be fine. The Lord said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. The Lord did not say what you quoted to me is incorrect. Not at all. He confronted Satan with a misapplication of Scripture. If I jump out of an airplane without a, without a parachute on, a law takes over. And by the way, I ain't jumping out of no good airplane. Not going to happen. That airplane stay in to fly. But if you jump out of that airplane with no parachute on, a law takes over. The law of gravity. What happens to you? <laughs> Down you go. Well, God will take care of me. He takes care of you when He tells you to put that parachute on. <laughs> he takes better care of you when He tells you to stay in the airplane. <laughs> Seriously. I mean, really. Somebody said, well, God called me to be a prophet buddy, and people have to acknowledge that. I'm going to walk right out in the traffic down here on Broadway. <laughs> All right. <laughs> go ahead and call the ambulance. Because <laughs> I've seen the drivers on Broadway. <laughs> My, I marvel, folks, at how people tempt and try God. They hold on to a scripture and they say, well, now this is it. This is the way it's going to be. It will be that way. But take the whole Bible for what it says and let the words of the Lord Jesus Christ burn in your soul. Don't tempt him. Don't try him. And God will prove himself faithful to you. I say, preacher, God's going to, God's going to feed me. He's going to take care of my family. He certainly is. Yes, he is. And then if when you're out of a job, you get up that morning and you go find you a job. Amen. And if you don't find one that day, you get up the next day and you go find you a job. Amen. So I can't find a job. I've seen cars out here. I've seen trucks out here. I've seen, I've seen uh, banners out here. Hiring, now hiring, now hiring, now hiring. They're everywhere. It might not be a $300,000 a year job and a nice uh, seventh floor in a skyscraper. But it's a job. It's a job. You show God you're willing to work and God may give you something better. That's the world I grew up in. We went out and got us a job. You can't find a job. You can find a job. You can find a job. It may not be what you want, but you can find a job. They're out there. God will always take care of you. That's the point, though. As the old timers used to say, do you pray and then put some legs on your prayer and let God take care of it. And he will. Father, in Jesus name, I pray you'd use what I've said for the glory of God. And I bless your name. I pray you'd help folks with what I've said. I didn't say it to hurt anybody. I said it to help them. We make foolish foolish decisions then we expect you to come and rescue us out of it never learn our lesson in order to help us we have to learn our lesson from our foolish decisions Lord bless thy people in Jesus name Amen let's stand up